there's too many people that are isolated in trying to do good work for God. They're all trying to figure out how to market Catholicism in a fresh way that actually engages people. So we tried it the first year, had tremendous success. It's exciting. I'm having fun. I'm meeting a lot of really great people. I have been to all of these shows over the last year, and by far this is my favorite. I want to emphasize the importance of what you're doing as lay apostles in the CMN. The Catholic Marketing Network has a service that the marketplace needs and the church needs. There's the distribution of a lot of Catholic religious items, but most of the people you talk to, they say, well, we really come for the networking. It's a great joy to be here. In fact, it was almost 10 years ago that I came to the Catholic Marketing Network for the first time. There was a friend and I putting out sacred music. St. Ignatius Press picked it up and they showcased us and before you know it, we had sold 20,000 copies to people like you. And that sprung board a company that now has reach in about eight different countries. I found really good and you know very interesting because I like when people come from everywhere and we can learn a lot. We come to show something but they show us too, so that's, uh, that's an amazing. This is always one of my favorite, favorite, favorite events. I always love coming here and being here because it's, uh, it's such a synergy to be around like-minded people with the same ideals, the same love for the church. So it's beautiful. Welcome to the Sowing Hope Podcast. This is a show all about implanting hope in our hearts. I'm Bill Snyder, joined by my friend Ann DeSantis. We're glad you're here for our uplifting conversation about faith and how it sustains our hearts through all the seasons of life. Thanks for walking with us. And good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Sowing Hope Podcast. I am Bill Snyder. It's wonderful to be with you. And as always, I am joined by my friend and co-host, Andy Santis. And uh, we are on the second part of our uh, Great Commandment series. I guess you can call it a mini-series. Uh, we, on Tuesday, talked about uh, our, our love that we're supposed to have for God. And now we're going to talk about our love for neighbor and for ourselves here on the podcast. But how are you this evening, and How is everything going? Oh, great, Bill. You know, um, I've, I've told you before on other podcasts that my favorite time of year is this time. So June just happens to be my favorite month. So, yes, I'm doing very well. <laughs> oh, good. Good. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely warming up out there, uh, even in even in uh, Wisconsin, where uh, it, it can be bipolar at some time, sometimes <laughs> uh, with the weather. But um, anyway, uh, I'm excited for today's episode because we get a chance to uh, not only finish up the Great Commandment uh, miniseries that we're doing here this week, but uh, I think we get to talk some about some really important topics and topics that don't often get discussed in the church, uh, you know, about loving our neighbor and also loving ourselves, I think, more importantly. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that today, Anne, and uh, I know that this also falls... Um, you know, squarely perfectly, right? Because uh, the reading for <laughs> today's today's uh, mass is the reading for <laughs> for uh, the, what 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 we're talking about. So I know uh, maybe to kick things off with that. Yeah, exactly. You know, I was reading this morning the the readings for daily mass for Thursday, June third, 
And lo and behold, now remember, Bill and I didn't plan that this would happen, right? That that, that this reading would fall on the day that we would broadcast uh, this particular topic of this, the the great commandments and the second commandment being to love your neighbor as yourself is that the gospel of Mark 12, 28 to 34 says that one of the scribes came to Jesus and asked him, which is the first of all the commandments? Jesus re- replied, the first is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God is Lord alone. And you shall love the Lord, your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. The scribe, scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you are right in saying he is one and there is no other than he. And to love him with all your heart and all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is worth more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered in under, with understanding, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God, and no one dared to ask him any more questions. Again, that's from Mark 12, 28 to 34, from Daily Mass reading from Thursday, June 3rd. <laughs> and yeah, perfect timing, right? You know, there are, there are no such things as coincidences in our, in our faith life. They're all God instances. God instances. They, um, they're, you know, they're blessings. And so, uh, you know, if, again, if you've been following along with the readings at, at Mass today, um, know that you'll fit right in for our conversation here on Sowing Hope. And, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, we, I think we did a great job on, on Tuesday talking about, you know, our love of God and what that really looks like. And so if you did miss that podcast, go back into our podcast feed or go onto our YouTube channel and take a listen to part one, uh, which we broadcast on Tuesday night. And, um, and, to de- and, and tonight we're going to really focus in on the love of neighbor and ourselves. I, I think, you know, for me, and when I, when I read that or when I listen to that, you know, love your neighbor as yourself— it, it, it's a conditional statement, right? Like, you know, it, 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 it's the same, you know, uh, thing that we hear in the Our Father, right? Like it's, you know, uh, our, you know Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It, it's a conditional statement, meaning that, that, you know, as we forgive those, you know, so, so it's like, okay, we have to, in order to, uh, receive God's forgiveness, we have to forgive others. That's a conditional statement. And the same thing is true here in this gospel, right? It's a conditional statement saying, love your neighbor as yourself, as yourself. And I think for, for me, you know, our, our love of self really depends, our, 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 how we love ourselves, I think, re- really reflects in how we love our neighbor, right? Like, like we... If we don't love ourselves, I think first, then we can't really go out and love our neighbor. I and mean, we, we often talk about that. There's that cliche like, I can't help somebody else if I don't help myself first. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's necessarily 100% true, but um, I, I think there's some truth into knowing that in order to love our neighbor to the best of our ability, we have to love ourselves. Uh, first. And, and so I think um, really unpacking that is something super important for us to understand in today's, um, in today's world where we just see so much, um, you know, unrest and violence and, you know, everything that's going on in our world today, right? <laughs> and really can stem off of, you know, the fact that we don't love ourselves the way we should or we're you know and so what does that what does that look like for you Anne? yeah i appreciate that bill and that's a good point because we if we really examine what does it mean to love yourself now in a worldly sense it means that i'm first right in every single way everything is all about me i'm a selfish person i take care of my family my stuff but don't care too much about anybody else it's all about my own pride and my own getting ahead in life. Now, that's not really love. And I think that's what Bill, what you and I were talking about yeah. before we started the podcast, that if you really examine love, right, when you love yourself, you you can see 
yourself the way that God made you and accept yourself for who you are. And then you suddenly realize that, you know what, it's not about that Anne is first in line when she goes to the store or that, uh, you know, you get that nice big pat on the back or the big paycheck. You know what I'm saying? I know I'm saying this quite simply, but there's two ways of looking at that love and the prideful love, the way that we're trying to grasp, uh, grasp and grab at the accolades of life. That's not really love. Okay. So if, you know, when you're not really thinking at all about anybody else, but you, right. Or your family, some people focus only on themselves or the people they care about, but they don't care about anybody else. Right. And so that's also not good. We can't just stop at our own families and our own homes and our own kids. Right. It has to be a, a love that goes beyond the, the four walls of our home and maybe of the people that we consider friends of ours. Does that make sense? A absolutely. And that really, truly is self-love. Right. Like like that doing doing what you just said you know, looking beyond ourselves and, and not thinking of ourselves as the most important person in the world and that, you know, the entire world does not revolve around, right, us. I think that's the other thing, too. We, we often get into this, the entire world re is going to resol revolve around me, right? Uh, and I need this and I have to put myself first. And I, you know, and and when you look at that, like, like from... That, that just isn't loving yourself. That isn't loving you personally. You know, uh, we, were, we were made by God to be communal beings, right? I mean, like, you know, in the, in the very first book of the Bible, in the very first chapter of the book, Genesis, God says to us, he says, it is not good for man to be alone, right? So, if, so th therefore, we know the world doesn't revolve around just one human being. It doesn't revolve around Adam. It, he, God said, no, no, it, it can't. It, you know, it's not good for man to be alone. So what does he do? He, he creates Eve. And, and therefore, we now have this community of people, but at the same time, knowing that we are uh, completely loved by God as a as a individual, knowing that we're his son or his daughter, that he, we, are, we are his creation to go out into the world and live with others. You know, we, we, we were not meant to be the center of the universe. If we were, God would have created the universe around you or I. And so I think that that's... <laughs> Phil, right, that's funny. Right? That's good. You know, and, and I, I, I just think that it's such an important point to remember that because when when we look at self-love and, and and there's some really important things that uh, we have to do to take care of ourselves like we, you know we talk about a lot about having um, you know self-care right being being healthy you know I mean I mean you don't have to go very far even into the Catholic world uh, to find people who will promote, Healthy body, healthy mind, taking care of oneself. <laughs> like, it's very important that we do these things, folks. Uh, you know, working out, uh, eating well. Like, like, God wants us to do those things. And, and that's part of self-love. That's part of loving ourselves. And then we have to will that into existence for the other people that we love and push them. In fact, um, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, yesterday... I was listening to a funeral mass um, of uh, an, an acquaintance that um, I, I knew from my time at Marytown, uh, just a, a wonderful uh, gentleman. His, his wife had uh, died of uh, brain cancer over the last 10 months, and uh, I had been kind of, you know, wishing him well on Facebook and, and praying for them. But uh, his, his wife's funeral mass was yesterday, and um, he was... Very good uh, friends with Bishop Hying, who is the Bishop of Madison, Wisconsin, right now, the Diocese of Madison. And uh, Bishop uh, Hying was giving the funeral, uh, you know, homily, uh, the homily at this funeral. And it was in incredible listening to him uh, talk, talk about what self love really looks like. Uh, he, he, his, his homily was fantastic. Uh, but 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 he he, he you know he he talked about how this woman 
had taken her life and moved from a foreign country to the United States, gotten married, created a beautiful family, was married for over 28 years, and willed into existence for both her husband and the bishop uh, the best for them. (laughs) In fact, the bishop said, you know, I wouldn't have spent as much time in the gym working out if it wasn't for your wife. <laughs> like, like that's, he said that to, to this gentleman, his husband, and it was beautiful, you know? Like, like I wouldn't have done that because, because she pushed me and you to live in a way that was healthy. So it's, it's, so it's about, you know, self-love is not just about loving yourself. It's also about loving the people as yourself to say, you know what, I will the best for you in your life. Bill, thank you for all that you shared. And I'm definitely going to listen to the podcast again because I want to take in everything that you just said. And you always give such great information about our reflections. You know, I think you made a good point when you said that God didn't make uh, make the universe around us, meaning that it's not like just me and the universe, right? There's other people involved. So when you unpack, what does it mean? What does it mean to say, I love myself? Okay. It's not the things that I said at the beginning of this podcast. It's not about the first in line attitude that it's all about me and my family, right? I get to include sometimes people obsessively love only the people inside their own lives, but nobody aside from that too. So it's got to be a way of looking at the world that, you know, everybody deserves to be loved and cared for. Now, we might not be the person to to be the hands and feet for every single person out there, right? I mean, but we can be the the hands and the feet for the people around us and the people that God has placed in our lives. Uh, Now, I thought I could reflect uh, on, actually, this is really my favorite Bible reading in the entire Holy Scripture, because um, I've experienced this myself, and I think it teaches us about this idea of loving your neighbor as yourself. And I'm going to read this from Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 29. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan, but because he wished to justify himself and who um, he said to Jesus, and who was my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man fell victim to robbers and he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. They stripped and beat him and went off, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road, but when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. Likewise, a Levi came to the place, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion at the sight. He approached the victim, poured oil and wine over his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him to the inn, and cared for him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper with the instruction, take care of him. If you spend more than what I've given you, I shall repay you on the way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was neighbor to the robber's victim? He answered, the one who treated him with mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Hmm. And uh, to me, that last line, that's what it means to be the loving your neighbor as yourself, okay? We all see people who have fallen down somehow into some kind of a ditch, whether it's a physical, psychological, life circumstance, whatever it is. I know I've been there. I've been there. And I have seen both of those characters playing out in my own life, people that walk by and people who come to help. Well, we're called to do what the last man did, the Samaritan, aren't we? We are called to take that man out and do what we can. Now we have to underline the word what we can, because we might not be the one who does all of the work to help rehabilitate someone, right? But we can be the hands that help the person up. We can be the person who encourages. I don't think that we want to be the person that ignores someone who's suffering, right? I mean, I know for me, I've seen it on both ends. And that's what God has taught me about loving our neighbor as ourselves. Yeah, you know, that is such a beautiful reflection, and I think uh, remembering that um, we cannot do it all, too, 
is super important, but we can do something. Just like you said, Anne, you know, you might not be the one that solves all of their problems. And even in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan didn't solve all of his problems, right? He, he, he got him to a, an innkeeper who was able to take care, of, take care of him on the next step in the journey. So don't feel like, you know, you have to do everything, but you can do something. You know, uh, there's, that, there's that reflection, um, you know, uh, in, uh, uh, written by Archbishop Oscar Romero, um, and, and it talks about, you know, we can do something, and we can do it very well. There's that line in there. You know, it, it, so, so we, c- we don't just have to walk by on the other side of the street. We can get involved and do what we can, you know, and that's part. And here's the thing, you know what, the, the Samaritan in that situation knew that he had enough self-love, knew, knew that he wouldn't want to be left in a situation <laughs> like that, and and so he acted, because maybe one day that Samaritan would find himself on the other side of the of the road <laughs> to be, um, you know, you know, to you know, turn it around, right? And it, it's not about you know what you know you know do you know it'll all come back to you and all. It's it's not about that. It's not about some Zen Buddhism thing that we're, we're talking about. But it's it's the the reality is is that God. Um, wants us to love our neighbor as ourself. And if we have the proper adjustment, like the Good Samaritan did, he, you know, you know, he said, all right, here you, here I am, right? Here I am, Lord. Um, I, I love you, God, first, and I love myself, and therefore I am going to extend this love, ex- this loving relationship that you and I have out into the world, you know, it's it, it. It almost mirrors the Trinity, right? Like we we often talk about how the love of the Father and the Son come together and create, not not necessarily create, but but bring forth the Holy Spirit in in the world, right? Um, so so these three beings, the it, it is it is the love of the Father and the Son that is the Holy Spirit, that that is what exists. Uh, because of the love of the Father and the Son. And so it's the same thing with us. We have the opportunity. It's not the exact same, but we have the opportunity, like the Father and the Son, when we have our relationship with God as sons and daughters, right? And and that unique expression then shows up in our love of neighbor, right? So like when when, when, when we think of that Good Samaritan parable, man, I love you so much, God. God, you love me so much that now... I have to extend that love. I can't do, you know, I, there's no way I can contain it. I have to share it. There's no way that I can, um, you know, bottle this up and be selfish and keep it to myself because that's not love, right? And we, you know, we just talked a lot about that, right? That selfish, selfishness is not love. Pride and all that isn't love. And the only way that we can, um, the, only, the only way that we can, um, you know, prove to others, and it's not always about proving it, but the only way that we can demonstrate that we have that interior relationship with God is to love others. You know, uh, I mean, how many times we call hypocrites, right? <laughs> right? It's like, oh, you know what? Yeah, I, I love God. I'm going to go to church every Sunday. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to check all the boxes, right? But if I don't put the gospel into action, then I don't truly love my, you know, I don't truly love myself, and I don't truly love others. So I think uh, that's a beautiful reflection, Anne, and one that I think we all should reread uh, in in the Gospel of Luke, for sure. You know, spend some time with that scripture today, um, rereading that, and of course the one for today uh, in the, in the uh, liturgy as well. Yes, excellent, Bill. So true, and I was thinking also about you know, and you've mentioned it before, that I wrote the book Love and Care for the Marginalized. It is a book available through Karis Publishing. And honestly, this is what the book is all about. I mean, it's all about taking that love that we do have for ourselves. And I mean a healthy love, not an unhealthy love or an obsession with ourselves and our pleasure, power, uh, and those things. And taking it and giving it to other people. Um, now, I did find something here, if I could read it. This is from online, from Catholic Son, from an author by the name of 
Ambria Hamill, and it's on what we just read on Luke, uh, Luke in chapter 10. And what, what this author says is that, uh, is that a neighbor is not simply one who lives next door or in our town or country. Our neighbor is not a geography, but of the heart. In this year, now it says in this year of mercy, because it was written back in the year of mercy, one whom we come across on the road when we travel, who is in need of money, food, and clothing is also our neighbor in this modern time. Moreover, to the all important question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Christ stresses here that it is not enough to acknowledge him as our personal savior as some Christians like born again preached, or it's not enough to fulfill our Sunday mass obligation or even visit our adoration chapel for many hours. We still need to do good works and be kind to our neighbors. We must practice the truth that we learn from the gospel. We must apply the example of the Good Samaritan to go and do likewise, Luke 10, 37. So I, I think it goes back to that whole idea of we, we, we need to look in the mirror and with the love that we have for ourselves. And like I said, a healthy love, we need to say, what is God asking me to do with my life? And I think this is where it all begins. And this is what I, basically what I talk about in my book yeah. is that we need to look at ourselves and say, there are people in my life right now. Now they could be in my house. They could be somebody I live next door to. This could be somebody that I work with. It could be somebody on your Zoom call who doesn't want to put their, their camera on because they don't want to see everybody. They're too ashamed of, of or, or too shy to be around other people. It could be someone who you go to church with who just doesn't quite fit in with the, with the popular group at church and with all those who are active in community. So I'm just asking to all of you listening to consider these things. It could be the person that you talk to, and instead of talking with them, you talk at them. And I think a lot of people do that without even realizing it. Uh, we can do something called active listening. And that means that giving them a chance to say what they want to say. And when people do that with us, how good does it feel when somebody asks you how you're doing and they're not waiting for you to just say, I'm fine, yeah. right? When they really want to hear how you're doing. And they don't judge you if you say something like, well, not so good this day, that they don't, they don't just kind of like say, oh, well, I'll pray for you. And then they go on to the next topic, you know, no. and praying for someone is a beautiful thing. But what I'm trying to say is we need to give our heart to other people who need a friend. That's what Christ is calling us and who he's calling us to be. Yeah. You're, you're, you know, yeah. you're spot on. Thank you. <laughs> you're spot on. And I think. Uh, the other the other piece of it too um, is that that you kind of alluded to are are the people that you don't necessarily agree with, and the people that you know I mean, and the people that are on the opposite side of the the fence from you. Like we we all have things that divide us, that uh, create you know, for lack of a better term, enemies. Right? Like not everybody loves us in this world. You know, there are people who dislike and hate others. I mean, we, we don't have to look very far <laughs> to see that. We don't have to look very far to see that. Uh, and, you know, all, all you got to do is go, go ahead, turn on your local news tonight, and you will see plenty of hatred out there. <laughs> um, turn on cable news, you'll, you'll, you'll see more of it. Uh, but, you know, here's the, here's the reality is that we were called to love those people that are on the complete opposite side of us. And, you know, here's, it's also from the uh, Gospel of Luke as well. It's a couple chapters earlier, chapter 6. And I just, I just want to read a little bit of it. Uh, it, it begins with um, uh, chapter uh, 20, uh, I'm sorry, verse 27 of, of chapter 6, and it says this, But to you who hear... I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. To the person who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other as well. And from the person who takes your cloak, do not withhold even your tunic. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from the one who takes what is yours, do not demand it back. Do 
as you would do as you would have them do to you. And then here's the key, verse 32. This is one of probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says this. For if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. You know, that right there is are, are, are two great questions, right? Verses 32 and 33 of, um, chapter, uh, of Luke chapter 6, right? For... For, for if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. You know, um, it is so easy, you know, and, and it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. Like, you know, duh, we, Jesus, we know that, you know. But, but man... There's something about it when you hear it again and again, and you read that again and again. It's like, you know what? I, I am called to love people who are completely on the opposite side of where I stand, you know? Um, and you may not have direct contact with people uh, who are, you know, outside of the Christian circle or outside. Like, you might not have that in your life. And maybe you do. And if you do, how do you love them? How do you witness the the living of the gospel, the good Samaritan in their lives, right? Uh, those people who disagree with you, hate you, um, you know, you know, at work, you know, maybe that there's somebody, a coworker that's competitive with you, and is trying to vie for a promotion above you or something. What, in in what way are you loving that person and showing them, you know, that even though you disagree and even though you don't like them and even though, how are you loving them? And that right there, uh, I think, also measures back to how much we, we love ourselves, knowing that God is going to provide in all circumstances. And, you know, that's, that's not easy. But, um, you know, I, I, I just leave that with you as a challenge maybe for this week. You know, think about how you are loving those who you vehemently disagree with. That is a great point because... You know, there's different personalities that we deal with all the time in our lives. I mean, there's people who are a lot like us that we get along great with. Bill, you're one of those people for me, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, and then there's people that, uh, you know, they do 90% of the talking and you do 10% of the, of, of the talking and listening or whatever. And and then there's people that are more on the quiet side where they're a little more timid. And I mean, there's, there's all different personalities. But my interpretation um, we have to love everybody. I mean, that's number one. And the way that we love people is different, but Christ really calls us when we read something like Luke 10, and we read about the good Samaritan, the people that were really called to love the most, obviously, and help the most are the marginalized. I mean, and you know, there's different definitions for that. Yes. I mean, it's the homeless and it's people who are rejected by society for some reason or another right? And sticking up for the unborn, of course, that's, that's also helping the marginalized. But I mean, like I said, those marginalized people, those people who are disregarded, those people who are not getting the support they deserve. I mean, that's what it comes down to. That's what a person who's marginalized is. They, they're not getting the love and support they deserve. If I can put my book into one line, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the people right? Now they could be your spouse. That could be your, your child, but it could also be, you know, your sibling or your, you know, somebody that you work with. So some small thing that you can do, you, you might not be the main person to help someone, but at least you are a person who's helped someone, right? Yeah. Now there's another perspective I thought I could bring up that I found online. And after I'm finished reading this, I'll tell you exactly where it's from. Uh, it says, but what if you cha we change the perspective just a bit? What if instead of understanding ourselves in the person of the Samaritan, we're the ones in the ditch? What if we're the ones who need healing? Putting our, quote, faith into action may also mean allowing others to help us to trust in God and our neighbor. The more spiritual meaning of the text is one that the church has often emphasized. Now, that is from, I'll tell you where that is from, that is online from prayer tellblog.com 
And the name of the blog is Prayer, Tell, Worship, Wit, and Wisdom. And it's from March 29th of 2019 by Tiva Regule. That's the, the person who wrote this. Um, but isn't that another perspective? What if it's you? And Bill, you and I both know, because we've dealt with health issues before, we've been there. Yeah. Yeah. A- absolutely. And, you know, um, I, I, I think to, to that point, too, when, when you've been on in, in this perspective, and I said this throughout really um, the, the, the birth of my son recently, is that, you know, when you, w- you have a privileged perspective, like when, when you've been beaten and left on the side of the road, you have a per- perspective that other people don't, right? Uh, when, when you've been in the hospital uh, for an extended period of time, uh, you have a perspective that other people don't. When you know, and and here's the amazing thing about that: God has given you that perspective that's uniquely yours for a reason, and it's all about that of sharing it with others, right? Like, imagine if the Samaritan had already experienced that. Maybe he did. Like, like, like I said a little bit earlier. Um, you know, he, he may have known that he didn't, you know, what would have happened if, if he was on the other side, he would want to take, be, be taken care of. Right. But, but what if he had already been there? What if he had already been left beaten on the side of the road? And we don't know that part of the story, right? That part's not written in the Bible, but what if that was his experience? And he knew looking at that guy, man, I've been there. I've seen that. And I don't want and I don't want to go back there. Right? And so I'm gonna pick this guy up because I know what it's like to be left for dead. Right? And and I think that a lot of us in our our Christian circles have to really look at that. And remember, there's that adage in our society, you know, remember where you came from. Well, I don't know if it's necessarily remember where you came from, but remember, you know, those significant events, right? Like, and and how God is going to use you in those, in that event in the future, right? Um, laying in a hospital bed, listening to doctors and nurses for a week after you've had, you know, open heart surgery, um, Change, you know, changes your perspective. You're able to then listen and understand and digest, and and get the terminology and, and and things in a different way. How how do you use that? Well, when you're in the hospital with a 31 hour labor with your wife, fighting for her care, right? Fighting for her um, and your baby and your baby's care. Being able to listen and cope in a certain way to help your wife, your baby, um, and and also understand and comprehend what the doctors are are saying and what the doctors and the nurses want to do and and how best to to put that into action, right? Like, but if but if but if you've never been there. If you haven't had that part of your story before, then then you don't have that perspective to be able to enter into the present moment and and love others. It's again, it's it's loving your neighbor as yourself, right? Now, is heart surgery and childbirth? You know, they're two totally different things. Do they both they both have a lot of pain? Yes. Uh, my my wife would tell you that uh, childbirth has a lot more pain than heart surgery, and I would agree with her. Um, but. But the reality is, is that um, you can still use your experiences. You can still use what God has given you from your from your beaten down side of the road moments to help others and to and to be able to listen and to be able to help in whatever circumstance. It might not be a medical thing. It it could be a, an addiction thing, right? It could be a bunch of different things going on in your life, right? And I mean, like it, it's not just one, you know perspective it god gives you your story so that you can then go help others that's the only reason why he gives you what you have 
uh, I wouldn't have this ministry if I didn't have three open heart surgeries. I, I would not. Ha- I would not. We would not be here talking right now if we didn't have these things. And I know Ann and I have told that story many times. But the reality is, I wouldn't have Patrick Art Ministry. It wouldn't be a five hundred one c three, and I wouldn't be there unless I've had those three th- You know, three open heart surgeries. Well, I just commend you on what you have overcome with God's help and, and also to your beautiful wife and the great job that she did, because I know that those 31 hours of labor were not easy. So I just want to say that before I say anything. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I think that what our suffering does is it teaches us something about love and sacrifice, you know, love, you know, love can be a feeling. Some people say love is not a feeling. I, th- I think it can be, it can be, but for the most part, Love is an action, isn't it? Love is something that we do and it's a choice, right? I mean, love is not all, you know, like Rocky said in in Rocky Balboa, when it's it's not all sunshine and rainbows. I mean, it's not going to feel great all the time, right? I mean, um, I've seen people that I know that have taken care of elderly spouses that at the end of their lives, it was a very hard thing for them to have have to take care of the person that was dying and 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 the difficulty that went with that but it that's what love is i mean and 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 so i commend people like that that are able to do it but it's only by the spirit of god that we can do that right we i think naturally i'm going to say this i think as humans we naturally tend to go toward what's easiest i think without god without god don't we you know, without God, we don't want any suffering. We want things to be easy. We want our kids to be the best kids in every way, to get straight A's and go to the school that we're praying that they get into, you know, and 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 so our lives become about this report card about who we are to prove to other people that we're somebody, right? Yeah. But at the end of your life, you know, even if you were the most somebodyest person, LOL, you know, those things are not going to matter at the end of your life. When people walk away from the cemetery, they're not going to say, Oh, well, you know, he was the president of this company or that he had all this money in the bank or, or that this woman you know, earned her doctorate or whatever it is, you know, I mean, those things are nice, but they're not really things that in a hundred years from now, nobody's going to care about those things. And God doesn't care about them either. Right. Right. God's not going to say, oh, well, he was a millionaire. Great job. (laughs) Right. I mean, for the most part, those things are not going to matter unless you do something with it. Right. If you happen to be a very wealthy person, you know, what did you do with it? Was it all for your vacations and for your bank account? And, you know, to make sure that your kids wound up being super uber rich when you died? Or was it because did you give some of it to help the poor or needy or, or, you know, life is not about us. And that's why I say there's that fine line between when we say how to, if, when you love yourself, Bill's not talking about the kind of love that I just said about being wealthy and taken care of, and that it's all about me and, and how smart and beautiful my kids are, and that my kids are the best in the world. And my job is the best, you know, it's not about any of that. Right. There's no competition in heaven. Okay. And actually, there's no competition to get there either, because the only test that we have to pass is that these two commandments, right? Mm. I mean, yeah, you have to, you, you, as Catholics, we believe you need to get those sacraments and you need to go to confession and be, confess your sins, of course. And we, we believe in God's mercy, but we need to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And we need to love our neighbor as ourselves. Yep. So if we're going to pass any test when we get into heaven or even to purgatory, it's going to be. How well did we do at those things? And I think there's some people who do a great job with loving God with all their heart, mind, and strength. Like like the little meditation that I read about when you can go to daily mass and still go to adoration all the time, but yet you're not really attentive to other people. We have to take that also into how we treat people too. So you can say all those novenas, you can be real religious, as some people say the words in quotes, real religious we can be, you know, very connected with our pastor and with our churches, but we still may not get that second part of the two commandments. We may love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, but we could walk by somebody right after mass who's suffering and could even use your smile. And yet you're talking to your friend and ignoring them as you're walking by. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like 
I, I don't know if you agree with that, Bill, oh, but 100%. I've seen it too many times. And I think there's some people that, you know, religion is not a checkbox. Religion is not something that I can say, well, I did my chaplet of divine mercy on all the three o'clock. I go to daily mass. All of my friends are religious. I pray charismatic prayer every night. I go to confession weekly. No, <laughs> those things are all great. But if you treat people like dirt, okay, and this is in my book. This is the actually last chapter of my book. We cannot be well catechized yeah. and, and, and treat, treat people badly. We can't. Yeah. I mean, if you treat people badly, then you, you really can't say and claim to be well catechized. It no. just, to me, that's what it comes down to. A amen. And I think, you know, um, how, how you were saying that not only that, you know, like, like, being being well catechized means to be to be a servant right they, being well catechized means to be a servant and i recognize how often i don't live up to that like i i recognize how often that i personally don't live up to that right uh and it's so easy i think it's very easy for us to fall into the checkbox mentality i think a lot of us just go check check Check. Oh, I did it. You yes. Know? And, you know, and it's like, okay, now let's slow ourselves down and really invite God into those moments. You know, I was thinking as you were talking in about uh, reading an article yesterday uh, came through on my Facebook. Um, I, I now have a lot of the late nights with my son uh, as he's sleeping or whatever. So I, I'm, you know, kind of just up and, you know, unfortunately, on my phone a little bit, you know, and, I, and, I, and I'm watching, you know, different things and seeing different things. But I was I was reading an article about the Friends reunion on HBO Max. They did this big reunion t TV show, right? The, you know, Friends TV show and how they all came back for this one reunion, this episode uh, that was like two and a half hours long on HBO Max. And and the article was saying that they had made. Two point five million dollars each to appear together on this episode, and and I'm sitting there going, you know, did do they know that like d does that amount of money, you know, bring people that like bring them together? Like, is that the reason why they came back together? So they could each get two hundred, you know, two point five million dollars each, or was it because they wanted to actually make a difference? You know, if if they wanted to make a difference and and inspire the fan base, like you know, again, this is a totally sec secular example, but like it's the same thing. Are we doing it for the right reasons in in in, in the church? Right? Are we doing it because we're checking boxes? And saying, oh, okay, uh, I'm going to go to Mass, but I'm going to ignore the people that really could use my help afterward, right? I'm going to go to lunch with my friends after Mass, and I'm not going to serve the poor and, and, and look around for those who might be marginalized. Or, or am I doing it just to check the box? Am I doing it just to get the $2.5 million? Am I, am, am I coming back together? Am I doing these things just because I want you know, some, some money or some recognition in the world? And I, I mean, I, I can't see, you know, people willingly wanting to get together. That's the other thing. Do you really want it? Do you really want it? Like if, if these five people or six people, these actresses and actors really wanted to get together and do a special, would they have waited 20 some years or 10 some years after this went off the air to do it? I mean, I, I mean, I remember when this was. Uh, you know, going the, you know, the final episode when I was in college. It was a big deal. I was a communication major. It was a huge deal, right? So t as a TV radio major, we were all, you know, huddled around the TV watching this two-hour-and-a-half-hour episode of Friends. And, you know, would they, if, if they were all truly friends, if they were all truly friends, would they have waited 10-some-odd years, <laughs> to come, to 10, 15 years, whatever it is, to come back together and... Or, or are they just doing a collect a paycheck kind of thing? You know, so really think about that with your faith life, right? Really think about that with your faith. Life. Are, are you doing it because you're doing it because I am going to check the box. It's going to look great. I'm going to get some extra, you know, uh, 
you know, and I get my extra two point five million in, in in you know in friendship bucks. Or, you know, you know after after church. Am I, am I really doing that, or am I doing it because I am a servant and I really want to love others and I want to help not only grow my relationship with God, but I want to grow my relationship with others. And I think, um, you know, if we're if we're truly friends with God. We're going to be living it, and it's not going to take us, uh, you know, a two point five million dollar carrot stick, uh, you know, carrot on, carrot on the end of a stick to to get us to do it. You know, uh, that's that's true love. That's you know, <laughs> that's the way I look at it anyway. Yeah, thanks for sharing about that. I heard about the friends reunion, but didn't know the part about the two point five million. So, uh, but the, it, the, the the point is, is that motivation is important. Okay, in everything that we do. What is our motivation? So I just challenge all of you, and I'm challenging myself too, that why do we do things? Why do we talk to certain people? Why are we friends with certain people? Why do we want our kid to go to this college, right? Or why not go to another one that might be cheaper but doesn't have that name or whatever? Why, why do we live in the house that we live in? I mean, is it because it has more room or is it because we want to have some kind of status? You know, so I mean, and I'm not suggesting anything here, but I'm saying that motive, ask yourself these kinds of questions. Why? You're, what are your motivations? And if your motivations are pure, then, you know, you are in God's will. If your motivations are pure and it's not a sinful action, then you're, you're trying to do and you have that relationship with God, too. Right. You add all these things together. But the point of it is, is well, when we say that you have to love your neighbor as yourself, the points that we're trying to make during this podcast is that when you read something like Luke chapter 10 and you read about the good Samaritan, just remember that we're called to be the Samaritan. We're called to be the person who helps somebody. We're not called to be, be the person who walks by. We're not called to be the person who says, I don't have time. And we're not called to be the person who doesn't care. Caring is, you know, caring means a lot. Even if you, if you care, there's some small action that you can do to help somebody. It might not be the main thing, right? I mean, I have people who come to me all the time and just want some kind of help, whatever it is. I might not be the one that helps them, but I'm not saying that I'm, I'm successful in, in this in every way, but what I try to do is connect them with the help they need. So I think that's what we're all called to do. Bill, thank you yeah. so much. Oh, and no, this is... Uh awesome and and thank you so much for you know thinking of this and this topic and and, and doing this i think and having these discussions is great i know that uh next week we're going to be back to having guests uh which which is wonderful i know uh terry modica is coming up uh on tuesday she's always an, a wonderful person to talk to uh foundress with her husband Ralph of Good News Ministries and so we're going to be uh, chatting with her again and um, and and many more great guests coming up um, as we continue through the summer uh, without really missing a beat so I, I thank you so much Anne for for all the wonderful work and, and stuff we you know you did a while uh, I've been welcoming Elvin into the into the family here and into the world so thank you so much for for all of that and and I'm excited to get back on and and start doing uh, some of the live shows so we've got uh, it's going to be wonderful that's right Bill thank you so much and everyone will see you all next week absolutely well folks I want to remind you too to go and visit our websites because uh, that's where you get all the good information uh, in between our shows uh, and all that stuff it's patchworkheart.org and andysantis.com don't forget to get Anne's new book love and care for the marginalized but until next time keep beating to your catholic heart and sowing hope into broken hearts thanks for listening to this episode of sowing hope on patchwork heart radio for more information about this podcast and our ministries visit our websites patchworkheart.org and andesantis.com You can also follow and interact with us on Twitter at PWH Ministry or andesantis2.